It will soon. <laughs> uh, Bruce Willis, you are missed, my brother. You are missed. What happened, um, Bruce Willis? Oh, brother, he's sick. Oh, I, uh, th- I thought he passed away. I was like, did I miss something? No, like, no, no. Demi Moore just shared his birthday um, video, but uh, it was the first like public showing of Bruce Willis um, since he was, you know, not doing too well. But damn. yeah, good old soon, Bruce Willis. Anyway, we got to talk Texas ball. All right, so let's be serious. Hey guys, Steven here, Fanatic Perspective. I'm so excited to have Tran back here. Um, it is, it is, you know, having the day ones on it is is is, is hits different. So Tran, what's what's good, brother? How you doing, man? What's going on? I'm glad to be back. Glad you're back. First of all, this channel has been lacking. Uh couldn't couldn't lock down Billy and uh and Brandon for, for a weekly chat. Brandon so gave me about 20 back. minutes of, of content while I was gone. The brother couldn't even give us a full show. Sad. <laughs> Love you, BA. <laughs> Love you. But it's good to be back on here. And today, uh, Tran and I are going to be discussing our favorite storylines coming out of Texas Spring Ball. They're in the midst of camp right now. Uh, just had their first scrimmage this past weekend. And as we're recording this, kind of that mid, almost that midway point before we get to April 15th, where we have our our spring game. But some really interesting storylines that we're paying attention to. Some are nationally known, as as everybody knows, and some are some things that we're more so locked in on ourselves. So these aren't going to necessarily be like position battles or or things of that sort, but just broader topic things that we're going to be paying attention to. And so we have five key things, five key storylines that we want to discuss. And um, as as a matter of fact, as we get on here, I want to give a shout out to a couple sponsors. We have Last Stand Hats, laststandhats.com slash fanatic. Hit the promo code fanatic10 right now. So, hey, look, you want to rock something like this to the Texas spring game. You need merch. I want everybody fresh when we get there for the spring game on the 15th. And nobody better to get fresh with than Last Stand Hats. Hit up laststandhats.com slash fanatic. Um, I posted the results for the bracket contest. Many of us, many of us are down very, very bad in that contest. Uh, but there's a few lone soldiers out there that pick UConn. So it looks like those of you are going to be, the, the four or five of you that pick UConn are going to be battling out for our winner of the Last Stand Hats contest to get a whole bunch of merch from them. Really excited about that. We're also really excited about our new sponsor, Aura. Aura is an all-in-one digital security services platform, VPN services, fraud protection, credit monitoring software, 24 by 7 white glove service for all of your digital security needs. Right now, folks, if you don't have digital security services or, or any of the things I mentioned, whether you're looking to get a new home, you're looking to rebuild your credit, you're looking to have some insurance against identity theft or fraud. If you don't have those things, whether it's on your devices or your own personal self, we are offering those packages here, or.com slash fanatic. Check out or.com slash fanatic. It is a free trial, 14 day free trial. If you've never done this before, had these services, Check it out so you can know, understand what the services look like. If you have, you know, a current vendor or anybody you're using, check out Aura because it is the most comprehensive, the best all-in-one platform to get all of these services. We're here supporting it at Fanatic Perspective or dot com slash Fanatic. We're very, very excited to be partnering with them. Yep, if it's good for Iron Man, it's good for you. It's good. Yay. We got RD, <laughs> we got RDJ on board. Iron Man on board. I mean, who who knows better than about security than Tony Stark? Come on, y'all. Um, uh, so with 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 you know, as we transition to Texas football and and just the excitement uh that is the spring, um, you know, hope springs eternal as as we are drinking Kool-Aid, you know, in very varying amounts as Texas fans. Um, there's some exciting storylines to look at. And we're going to start off with the big one right off the break. And it's the quarterback room. We are not here saying that there's a quarterback competition because, in my opinion, there is not a quarterback competition. I believe when Ewers 
will be your starting quarterback barring injury. Uh, and, you know, we have a very, very deep room behind him. And I expect him to have a marvelous sophomore season under Steve Sarkeesian and really ingratiating himself within the offense. With that being said, Tran, there's a Manning in the room. And with Mannings come what, Tran? It comes eyeballs. It comes, you know, TMZ. It comes paparazzi. The entire aspect, all eyes descend on the Texas quarterback room um, with, with those big names in there. So why why do we have this one as, as a storyline, you know, just in terms of what you're paying attention to per- personally? Well, it's, it's it's the most important position on the field, especially in Steve Sarkeesian's offense. You need to have someone to run it. And, you know, I, I in a way, I kind of disagree with you. I do think that there's a quarterback uh, uh, competition, and, but it's for the backup. So it's between Malik Murphy and and uh, Manning and uh, Arch Manning. And it's very important to keep an eye on that competition, too, because what happened to yours last year? He he did. I think it was an AC joint separation or something yeah. like that, yeah. which that could Out really or you game. Yeah, it could be reaggravated at any time. So I agree with you. I think it's a hundred percent Quinn Ewers' job. I th- I have a feeling we're going to see him uptick a lot, especially with the emergence of the people around him as well. But we really need whoever's going to be backing him up because I, I hear it's pretty close. I hear Malik Mur- Murphy spinning the ball pretty well. Um, of course, Arch, anytime he throws a touchdown, the, the media, Texas media team is going to throw <laughs> throw it out there for the clicks and the likes and the views and everything like that. But, you know, we need to, we need a solidified backup that can come in just in case. And hopefully we're, we're blowing teams out and we can get that second, second guy, some snaps just in case so some real game snaps. So, it's going to be something that you keep an eye on because it is the most important position on the field, like we said. And, and I mean, it's Texas. That's we, we don't, we don't have a face of the program yet. And, you know, that's going to be the face of the program. So, you know, what's interesting to that point, I think uh, you, you made it and, and I hadn't thought about it before we got together. The, competition and the importance of QB2 because Hudson card was really valuable for us last year and we didn't realize it until Mm -hmm. it happened we didn't realize how much we needed Hudson card until we needed Hudson card and so to that point who's going to be Hudson card this year like like it just because you know we feel good about QB1 and we feel like he's going to make a leap does not mean that, you know, health willing. I mean, look, across college football, I'm so happy you made that point. Um, things aren't always neat. You know, you never know. All it takes, you're one play away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and in some cases, you know, even going back to last year, going into the UTSA game where we were down to potentially QB3 and Charles Wright playing. So we, that, that whole dynamic and their development. And also, uh, you know, Sark, the quarterback play the last two years at Texas has been good, not great, in my opinion. I feel like we've had some good moments. I mean, some of our biggest passing games in school history were, were under Casey Thompson. Um, you have games last year where Quinn Ewers set the world on fire versus Bama. He looks sensational, one of the best quarterbacks in football against OU. Um, but then we also have some low points in the Casey Thompson season, the Quinn Ewers season. Hudson Card had his highs and lows. So we haven't had this stellar, uh, overworldly quarterback play under Steve uh, that he's shown at his other schools, right? So what does that also look like combined as a room, as a group? Are we going to see that ascension because of the experience, because Malik's been in the program, because Quinn's been in the program, because of Arch's in in air football IQ? Can this room take that stride forward? Trang, you're moving me right into the next one because you mentioned another thing. Face of the program. We are now in a post B. John Robinson world. And I'm focusing on B. John Robinson because we know he was the face of the program. He was one of the faces of college football, one of the, 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 the signature players in the sport. And one of the reasons why, from a market markability standpoint in the NFL, he is going to be an extremely popular player day one. I know you can't replace somebody like that just outright one for one with another player, but 
Texas is going to need to market somebody. And Texas is going to need to have somebody step up as a leader on the field, off the field. Who are some of the people you're looking at um, that could potentially step up for Bijan? Because we're not just talking about replacing a running back. I feel like we have a group of guys in there. But overall, who who's stepping up uh, you know, to replace Bijan Robinson or or candidates to replace Bijan Robinson? So I mean, there, there's going to be there's going to be the you know the the everyone's going to say the quarterback win yours, of course because I mean he's he's been slowly been transitioning to that role since last year with with you know the marketing and video teams and everything like that. Um, then there's going to be Xavier Worthy because he's a big personality. He's he's the receiver. Um, but one person I want to select, and I don't know if necessarily he's going to be the quote unquote face of the program. But I think he's he he should be he should be up there is uh, Jalen Ford. Jalen Ford has all the accolades. He's the leader of this team. He should have damn well been Big Twelve Player of the Year in my opinion. Um, and you know he's he's someone who backs up he his had play. my vote for Defensive Player of the yeah. Year for Big Twelve, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah no and I, I, to Felix, but and, yeah. and he's just not a guy that people are talking about. And I do I I think he's the unquestioned leader on the defense. I think he's an unquestioned leader. And I think we're going to have a very special defense this year. And I think it's going to be, he's going to be a huge piece of that. So that he would be my pick to choose as the, as the face of the program going, going for this next year. Now, you know, I, is it hard to select a defensive player? Yes, you have to be outstanding. But Jalen Ford to me was outstanding last year. Look at Tram picking a defensive guy. Of course. <laughs> that's another one. That's another one where that train is never late. I know my people, guys. I know I know, I know my people. He's always gonna lobby for his people on his side of the ball that he played and he grew up with. He gonna lobby for guys. But you know what? Jalen Ford, to your point, we did see um, and this is going back because we've had some really good defenders at Texas and, and guys that came into like coming off a good year where they were building and it's like, Oh, this person, you know, had a star studded season. And because of the way Jalen Ford plays defense where, you know, he had the freedom to blitz, but also played a lot of coverage and was getting intercept, getting turnover. He wasn't just the stereotypical tackling machine that was really good against the run. He was, he was, he was good both ways. Right. And so, and really got better as the season went on, in my opinion, in coverage where it started out kind of like as a weakness, he be, he became a strength where he started baiting people and doing really high IQ football shit. The last guy I think back to is like Derek Johnson. I don't know if you, yeah. uh, I know you remember cause your brother played yeah. with him. Uh, yeah. What am I saying? Um, when he came back, after like he calls all those fumbles, but he came back like that next that extra year, and Derek Johnson was just like different well, that last. Can, year. can we also give him a, a shout out on the way that he announced that he was coming back too? He's he made Mac Brown sweat like he was about to go to the NFL, <laughs> which I thought was so funny and such a baller thing to do. So yeah, Derek Johnson is awesome forever. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable final, you know, Texas career. But those, like, I remember, like, those were the NCAA football days where he was like, I had him like a 99 overall linebacker in the video game. And, you know, Mm -hmm. he he was one of the players. You remember you could get three players that had the little pulsing dot where they could go on fire. He yeah. was one of our pulsing players. And he, so it was like you know, he got going. He could just go and strip the ball from anybody. <laughs> so um, those, the, you know, that's exciting, right? Um, I, I think offensively the way we're going, um, I think when yours definitely just with the, the seriousness he's approaching the game. Um, and, and quite frankly, Sark, Sark needs to show, I just said, He's had good quarterback years. We need to like it's all Sark too. Like if if Sark is the guy and in, in the play, like what we've known and seen, we need to see more consistency from that position and making it more quarterback friendly as well. We already started to kind of see the shift in terms of opening up the passing offense and the weapons we've gotten since, you know, picking up an AD Mitchell in the portal, 
the the immense talent we've added at receiver uh, with these with these freshmen that aren't just freshmen, but they're freshmen that are going to be, you know, guys that are, we feel are going to be ready to play sooner rather than later um, and that are early enrollees. You have a, a, a all world potentially tight end. There's a lot of, in play. And, and I think it's just going to be really difficult to expect a running back to take that mantle. Um, you know, yeah, I, I'm excited about Jonathan Brooks. I'm excited about Cedric Baxter Jr. I just think that that group, um, more than what Sark traditionally likes, Sark does traditionally like to have one runner, um, maybe two. But with the different skill sets and abilities in there and kind of moving on to the next topic that we'll cover, um, I, I do think that you'll see a lot of different people showcase, but you maybe not have that one Doak Walker type guy, which is okay if you make the ascension with the quarterback play. But the next thing I'm really excited about, and this is just me being excited, and I know you having an appreciation for this, this might be the best offensive line on paper that Texas has fielded in maybe 20 years, like in all seriousness. And I know we're still dealing with some youth, but we are not lacking for talent. And the resume is really already there with one Kelvin Banks. Jake Majors has tons of experience at center. But when we start going across the board with these names, as well as the depth in the room, it's insane, Tran. And I'm really, really excited uh, for the offensive night. You were talking when we were we were kind of prepping for this, you were just blown away by the sheer size of guys i know i know the kyle flood thing is giant humans thing but when you actually look at some of the sizes of these guys absolutely absurd there i think there's one that was six six three sixty five or something like that uh there's another one that was 358 i was like geez these are gigantic human beings and, and one of the things that that really stands out to me is that you're not hearing that they're Big for no reason. Like I, I think I think that's a quote from you. It's like they're not big for no reason. They're just yep, big. That's me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh but like you said, the depth and the competition aspect of it, people want to be in the starting line right now. I mean, we have the two spots locked down. The left and right tackle, which are the most important position. That's if we knock on wood, keep those guys healthy. Those are the most important positions for, for a pocket passing quarterback. So we have those two solidified. With experience. Solidified. We haven't had that in since, what, 2005? <laughs> I think we've returned tackles before, but like, but no, no, I mean, not like we felt this good. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's like, like this. And I am, I, we all thought that Christian Jones was leaving. So for him to come back and then everyone not hate on him for coming back, but they're like, all right, well, find me a spot on the offensive line because I want to play. This is a Christian Jones that a year ago everyone people hated. were ready to, to, <laughs> to move on, Yeah, right? And he's one of our highest graded guys for coming back. He has a great year at right tackle, clearly mm-hmm. belonged at that position. And now it's like a luxury that he's back, right? Like, Crazy what a year can do. Crazy what a year a productive year can do, Trent. Yeah, it's it's a new lease on life. I mean, I think that was probably the best move for him to to move from left to right tackle because I think he's found a home. And I think I think if he has another productive year like he had last year, he'll be draft he'll, he'll be drafted. He he's always said they've always said he has the prototypical size. I mean, he just needs to back it up with tape. You're we're we're looking at you know Hayden Connor back at left guard who has experience there started all last year very smart kid huge body very versatile Hayden Connor can play tackle he can play guard we even heard he's getting reps at center um, you know and 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 because last year you know we know Junior Angulao was in the mix pushing Jake Majors um, as we're trying to get a little bit more beef there but Jake Majors still holding it down. Um, multi multi year starter, so trying to you know bring up that depth there. Where does Cole Hudson, who started all last season for us, where does he fit into play? Because you got a competition 
going on between DJ Campbell and big Cam Williams. Cam Williams thinking that, oh, Christian Jones about to go to the league. I'm going to come right in at right yeah, tackle. It's my spot now. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, and we got dogs behind him. I mean, young freshman Pey- Peyton Kirkland of the world. You got Neto, uh, Neto and Malik Agbo in there. Like, just, you know, if they want to go with that swing tackle look that they did last year with Andre Carrick, do one of those guys jump in there at swing. The, the thing is, the reason why we're excited is, even though some of these names we're mentioning are unproven, per se, A, they're very, very highly regarded, very talented guys guys that have developed size-wise. We saw the strides that they made with the younger guys that did play last year, i.e. Kelvin Banks and Cole Hudson, and how productive they were. Um, So it it would be safe to assume that some of the guys that were in the incubator already can come in and fulfill that depth, but also give this staff options. Because it's not just who's the – it's the best five, but the best five that work together. Mm -hmm. So Kyle Flood is going to – you know, communication, chemistry, all of those things, because they have a chance. Everybody, you know, we talked about replacing Bijan. We're also replacing Roshan Johnson, his leadership and everything he gave to this team. Those are two NFL runners that had to create a lot on their own. They didn't just wasn't because we had elite run blocking. That was actually we were actually a better pass blocking team last year than we were a run blocking team. But philosophically, these guys want to run inside zone. They want to they want to lean on guys. They want to be physical at the point of attack. In order to do that, you need these large humans. You need to be able to move. You need to be able to play aggressively. And I think they got the options, Tran. I think they have the versatility. I think they have the options to find not just that best five, but have that core depth there um, when injuries happen. So the thing that I really like about the depth that you touched on is that we have a lot of young guys in the room. But at the same time, these young guys who are behind our our proven starters, I would say, um, they can finally we can finally start a factory and have a what good looks like, and hopefully they can start prepping so the next next line comes in and they're ready right right, and then it becomes cyclical, and we can have that what Alabama had, you know what Kyle Flood built at Alabama. I hope he does that here. Completely agree. Now, as we flip over to the other side of the ball, the last two topics we want to hit on. Number number four um, is actually going to be, you know, what those guys have to to, to block against or defend against, and that would be edge guys. And um, I'm excited about our edge group, but I think for me, uh, out of all the storylines of the spring, because of a, we you know, we value positions, right? And so while there's other position battles going on that we're well aware of, I'm sure you guys will listen in the comments. Why aren't you missing linebacker? Why aren't you missing this? Quarterback. But, with, and, yeah. <laughs> but when it comes to edge um, and, and what those positions, you know, look like and what the depth is at Jack and Buck and, and what we're putting out on the field, I do think that there's – I'm definitely more excited than I was last year going into the season. That was a big – last year was a big – I'm not going to lie, it was a big – Red flag for me going into the last season, especially after we didn't land O'Shawn Mathis, who ended up going to Nebraska. And it turned out that we were okay at edge. We we weren't as bad as I thought we were going to be. You know, Ovia Gofu since gone on uh, to LSU. Baron Sorrell has is is to me solidified, solidified yeah. one one side there, right? And and he was um, one of our better pass rushers, if not our best pass rusher. But it's a depth position. It's a position of volume, and it's a position where you really need talented cats. You can't afford to have JAGs at that position. Just another guy can't afford to have that at those positions. So, Chan, we got some options this year. Um, You know, they're starting to starting to hear about the Jamon Taps of the world, who Mm -hmm. we didn't see too much of last year. Um, You know, we saw Ethan Burke at times last year, but he was a young freshman. We got his fellow Bash brother in from Westlake now. That was a tough, Colton. tough battle. Mr. Colton, Colton. Bass again. Yep. Um, you know, Justice Finkley right now, um, probably the, the the favorite to start, opposite of a Baron Sorrell. I'm still I, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic with these edge guys because I know what talent they have, but it's a little different story in terms of that production we need to be able to be that special defense like you mentioned when you were talking about Jalen Ford. 
Yeah, no, you're you're right. Uh, we have to we have to have another side of that because te- teams will get smart and say, "Hey, this this person has issue with you know a run fits run fits or he they they bite on the fake on the option or, or things like that." They'll, and I don't think that we uh, I, we have to handle it with a with a committee, but we need to have someone to lock down that first team that first team, those first team reps. And, you know, I, I agree with you. I think Jamon Tapp and uh, Justice Binkley probably are going to get the majority of those snaps on that side. But if, if they can, if one of those can't separate themselves from the, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. And I, I hope that those young bucks that you were talking about, like Colton Bassett come in, come in ready to work to, Hey, let's, let's, let's get ourselves a spot. Even if we dumb down the defense for you and just say, "Hey, play upfield, play upfield, play upfield," we'll 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 have a linebacker over your back shoulder for for run help. We need them to. I mean, we yeah. were hockey subbing people last year and 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 doing that whole thing. So I mean, we we got to have guys um, where you know people aren't taking snaps off or we're so one dimensional. Um, I expect the, the the I'm excited about Baron Sorrell because. From his first year to his second year, I saw immense improvement. And did now, he lead our team in sacks? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so to to then say okay, and I think he had like around five and a half, maybe maybe right there at six or around that yeah. mark in sacks, right? But as he goes to you know another year in the program, getting stronger, he's seen himself have success. He had success against some good tackles at certain points last year. Certain points where you're like, wow, this guy, you know, looks even better, clearly better than his his ranking that he was recruited at. But um, having more of those guys develop and step up, I think is is, is huge for us and something I'm definitely paying attention to um, come spring ball yet again, just like we did last year. And we're also, you know, having those conversations in the back of our minds as fans is, if we have to supplement somewhere in the portal, where where are those positions look? Now, again, it, this is why it's so key with the edge. The hardest position to supplement, if you don't feel great about it, in the portal is edge. Is the edge, yep. Yeah, because they're at a premium. Everyone wants edge it. Edge guys <laughs> don't enter the portal. Yes. <laughs> you hang on. Those are the people that are getting NIL money. You hang on to those people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you you want to be able to have a quarterback. You want to be able to protect your quarterback. You want to be able to attack the other person's attack quarterback. The quarterback yeah. It's not deep. <laughs> it's not deep. That's why we will keep hammering home this edge conversation. And the reason why, too, is it allows more flexibility with the overall defensive scheme and what PK can do, knowing the experience we have coming back, secondary, you know, middle of the field defense with our linebackers the more dynamic we can be with our rotation and not having to be, you know, blitz heavy. I've always said we got to be hybrid. We have to be multiple in what we're doing. You know, I don't want to just sag off and only play rush four every single time. But in in certain situations and scenarios, you want to know that, hey, the guys we're putting out on the field are a threat to get home and cause havoc. Um, The last one is is actually involving the person that is coaching the defensive line and and a bigger point. Um, Tran – the storyline here is about the staff and, and and keep in, in, you know, the sense of urgency we've had probably the most consistency I've seen at Texas in a long time in terms of the coaching staff. We've only really had turnover at running back. And that first year was because the running back coach got promoted. Now head coach at Temple Stan Drayton. We've had turnover obviously every year with the receiver position, um, you know, uh, you know, Andre Coleman leaves the program, you know, Brennan Marion gets promoted. Mm-hmm. He goes to UNLV to be an offensive coordinator. Now we're bringing in Chris Jackson of the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's it. Over the entire Sark era, that's that's the coaching turnover we've had. We've had the same offensive line coach. We've had the same person in tight end special teams. We've had the same uh, – uh, uh, all the defensive Linebackers coaches that have remained in yeah, place. We've had the same – yeah. Right? Now, I know this is the part point of the video where somebody's going to chime in about Gary Patterson, but that is not what we're talking about, yeah. okay? We're, we're not talking, talking about, about analysts. <laughs> analysts. We're not talking about them. Not a position coach. 
not a coach with a headset, but an analyst. Yes. <laughs> That's so in all seriousness, though, um, Jamar Cain Tran is going to the of the LSU type formerly of the LSU Tigers. Is go, where is he going? Denver Broncos, right? Denver Broncos. He was their defensive line coach. So LSU has an opening. And they they have multiple targets. Brian Kelly's looking to fill that 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 spot on his staff. But one of the primary targets that they have is Bo Davis. And knowing him, I um, believe he's an alum to LSU and, and the opportunity that could be on the table uh, for him to be poached right away. Um, it, as, as we're recording right now, LSU people – are, are are telling us that that that's who they are identifying, and I know some of our people on the inside have re- reported that as well. We'll see how it plays out um, if we counter and things of that sort. But a, it's refreshing to have coaches that are good enough that other people want. That that's a good sign. And when you look at the job that Bo Davis did last year, I mean, it's obvious what his value is, Tran. Um, but we got to have a sense of urgency. I feel like to to a to retain him, but also to to justify that good coaching with wins. What say you about all this? So, as a defensive guy, you want to have a fiery personality on staff. You don't want a just a a zen defense. I'm sorry, you just you do, you you want a a tough. I'm gonna hit you in the face type of guy. Kwiatkowski's not that guy. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Kwiatkowski's not that guy. I've heard, maybe heard him speak three or four times this tenure here. Uh, but I think no guru the, though. But he's yeah. not the yeah yeah, yeah, yeah he yeah, and that's fine. I mean, different personalities mesh on staffs, and that's perfectly fine. Um, Bo Davis is that guy for us. He was the. I, I feel like he had a huge part in the turnaround from our really crappy season to a respectable season and with his recruiting and his coaching, I feel like the defensive line has been shored up a lot. You can make the argument. They were the most productive group last year. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Between them and And, running back. And I know this is this, this rumor has legs to it and everything like that, but Defensive line coach is so important to a program. Offensive line coach, so important to a program. So I hope, I mean, this is, I mean, this isn't us <laughs> that that makes these decisions. But if it's a money thing, please just write that check. That's <laughs> that's that's my whole thought process. Because I do see light at the end of the tunnel of this very, very dark time in Texas football for the past what? 13 years in my eyes. I mean, there's a couple good years sprinkled in, but I see a light at the end of the tunnel for us actually building this program back. And it's, and we need, we need people like Bo Davis. We need people like Kyle flood to, uh, to, to maintain on our, on our staff. At least until we get to that point where we hit, I mean, I, I, I know Kyle flood to my knowledge, still has head coaching aspirations, mm-hmm. and 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 some some of the other coaches on the staff do. But there's a reason why they've they've held serve here. They want to kind of finish that job, or at least get it to the point where it's like, all right, this thing is built up. So the person that um, takes over for me is inheriting, a, you know, a, something that has already been developed, right? And you just keep going. But um, I thought what you you know well said, Tran. Um, these are things that are important for the culture mm-hmm. and and meaningful to how the vibe is in the locker room with the staff and the players. And and it's clear that players have responded to Bo Davis. And please keep in mind, we're just talking about something that is rumor because of an opening and it's involving somebody that is an alum to the school. So it, it is something where we have to pay attention to for that. Right. Uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a slum school either. It's, it's poor little old LSU as <laughs> right, right. And and Brian Kelly over there already, you know, already ha- having success 
we know the recruiting ties in the state of Louisiana and and, and just how well they're they've off they're off and running at, at LSU. Um, shameless plug here. I'm I'm part of the SEC Connect crew. And so we cover SEC football over there on that second YouTube channel. Subscribe to the SEC Connect. But I mean, we talk a lot about LSU over there and, and some of the things that are going on across the entire Southeastern Conference. And and now it's it, it's it's something to pay attention to. But these are these are things where hopefully we're able to keep Bo um or he doesn't consider it. I don't know. This is just as we're recording this. Things we've heard from LSU people. Um, I think I'm starting to see some reports bubble up as well. Um, that that he's a person of interest for LSU. But we, you know, storyline to pay attention to as we come out of spring ball to hold our team, you know, together. And and, and I want to see us win with this staff and be rewarded for the continuity and be rewarded for doing things the right way and growing this program. So just to recap our five. Um, quick. Bo, oh, stay off the mf <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I missed you, man. I missed you. I actually almost said it. Not going to get you demonetized, my friend. <laughs> um, yeah, this guy comes back to the channel and immediately gets us demonetized. <laughs> Sponsorship deals cut. We're in shambles. And um, Trad, you're on timeout. <laughs> Where's Trent? I haven't seen him. <laughs> oh, it's me, buddy. <laughs> this guy's bad for business, man. Um, he's a liability out there, coach. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, our five to recap. Um, obviously, the biggest storyline, any quarterback room that has Arch Manning in it is going to be a storyline, is going to be something – we all pay attention to and cover uh, for the remainder of Texas, but also in, inside of that, as Tran mentioned, the battle for QB two and 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 establishing that depth there. Um, so big, big, big thing to pay attention to. The second thing, face of the program, who's replacing B. John Robinson, such an impactful person, you know, a unique generational guy we had at our program, but. Who were some of the candidates or, or people collectively? Uh, I know Tran threw out Jalen Ford having that special season on defense. And we look to guys like Quinn Ewers offensively to kind of take that mantle up as Sark looks to go from good to great with his quarterback play. We're really excited about the offensive line, y'all. This isn't just Kool-Aid. Um, they, the, the, they're not skipping steps, you know, as my buddy, Chris Simpkins out there says, they're not skipping steps, especially with this group, uh, big humans is the theme and, and, um, the path has already been established there. The question around the edges, cautiously optimistic with this group, the talent has been upgraded. Will the production follow? And lastly, uh, the sense of urgency and continuity around the coaches, and one Bo Davis, uh, you know, with the with the interest of LSU. I'm not going to say Bo Davis' interest as of now because I've not heard that, but the interest that LSU has in him and um, just overall keeping the staff together so they can reap the benefits of their work. Um, Tran, great to have you back, brother. I'm so happy we, we get to record and do this. Yeah, um, it's great to be back, buddy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, quick shout to our sponsors, Last Stand Hats, Trans Rock and Last Stand Hats right now. We got them all over, baby. LastStandHats.com slash Fanatic. Fanatic 10 at checkout. 10% off on your purchase. Bracket contest winners coming after Final Four weekend and Monday will be announced. Um, good luck to all of you that are competing in the bracket challenge. You're probably down bad like the rest of us, though, and I already have a, have no dog in the fight. Um, very nasty Final Four that's happening right now. Very nasty Final Four. It's terrible. Uh, we should cancel it. You know, but hey, everybody likes parody, right? And um, our second sponsor, our and brand new sponsor, Aura, Aura, which is a all in one digital services, all in one platform, all of your devices, fraud. You know, protection against fraud, identity theft protection, credit monitoring, VPN services, multi devices. We got individual packages, couple packages. If it's just, you know, you and your partner, significant other, family packages, you, you know, kids can be a threat out there on the iPad or whatever device or on a phone. 
and you want to make sure you're covered. You want to make sure you have insurance. Guys, in this age of such, you know, malware, cyberware attacks, it is imperative that you have protection. So Aura.com slash Fanatic, we are offering a 14-day free trial. So if you've never, you know, you're not familiar with services like this or you've never, you don't have one or you're looking for somebody, you're like, you know what, I know I need one. I got too many kids in the house running around on random devices. We need to make sure we're covered. Take advantage. It It's freaking 14-day free trial. Sign up today, or.com slash fanatic. Tran, you know what it is, brother. We, we're going to be back at it again. Always. Guys, horns always up. Welcome.